Thanks very much. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation. So this is um, pretty much preliminary work. So it's fantastic to present this so you guys can go at me and uh, poke holes on it. But it sort of struck me as I was reading the literature on the circular economy, which has actually been quite influential. There are quite a number of countries around the world that have embraced this and developed policy initiatives around it. Um, you will not find platforms mentioned in this literature, hardly at all. And then we turn to the platform literature, which is quite rich now. There are literally thousands of papers that have been written on uh, the phenomenon of digital um, business models, <clears throat> particularly platform business models. And uh, again, you will find very little about the circular economy. So I guess my argument uh, today is to bring these two literatures together and think about how we can embrace uh, concepts of circular and bring them into the platform world because platforms actually have a lot of advantages in advancing circular type models. <clears throat> we currently live in uh, what they call the linear economy in which it's all about supply chains to take the materials uh, we make stuff, and then um, <clears throat> the platforms have come in to um, help distribute that to users, and then it ends up as waste. And then, of course, there's been some effort to introduce recycling, and that has been pretty inadequate. Um, <laughs> when you look at the, the amount of material that's uh, mined globally, it's upward to 100 million tons and uh, less than, except this numbers were calculated three or four years ago, about 9% gets circulated. That number has actually dropped in the last several years. So we're actually going backwards in terms of material use. So there's a lot of attention to this idea of how do you make economies more circular um, so that you're not just recycling, you're also repairing, reusing, um, um, refurbishing, types of activities, and it's really about externalities. And when you think about platforms, many people think, oh wow, they're incredibly disruptive to economies. But in many instances, all the platforms have done is to juice the existing um, linear economy. And so I guess what I'm gonna advocate today is we think more about how platforms can contribute to driving uh, more circularity. This is a, a chart, and I've redone it a bit here from the World Economic Forum. We're way down here in terms of the amount of circularity of the economy, and there's ambitions and policies being put in place to try to drive that number up. I think it's quite ambitious to think that we could get to full circularity by 2035, but at least you know we need to make a whole lot more progress. And some big phenomenon are actually challenging that. So we talk a lot about the great energy transition, the need for more renewables, but renewables require a ton of material. Think about uh, the fact of solar. We get all excited about the costs of solar going down, but when we do the projections out to the end of life solar, we're talking about 60 million tons of solar going into landfills by 2035 unless uh, the current systems are changed. So the thing that uh, is quite interesting is that, the, as I mentioned, this idea of circular economy has been quite influential, but the target has really been about individual companies. It's almost the eat your peas kind of thing where um, they say that individual companies should become more circular. And so I think having a lot of folks here thinking about platforms, um, going circular together makes a whole lot more economic sense, right? Is, uh, not just doing it on your own, but many companies collaborating in a collective market or platform in which you're able to <clears throat> take those inputs, match them with um, participants that actually could benefit that, not only in your own company, but in not only in your own industry, but potentially tangential industries as well that could benefit from that. And there's a bunch of um, reasons why we could imagine that this would be beneficial, which I've listed here which is lower transaction costs of doing it together rather than trying to go circular on your own, the liquidity that's created by having many buyers and sellers, the positive network effects that could be created by circular platforms, 
um, expanding reach, that is being able to attract uh, participants in matches and other industries. Um, and then growing communities. There's interesting things that can be done around nudging and things of that nature by building communities around these, um, and then incent incentives for innovation. So there's actually um, a number of circular platforms already in existence, but as somebody mentioned, these are pretty subscale and small, and so the impact uh, on a global or even regional or national basis is still pretty small, but it is interesting that there are these platforms and I think the platform community needs to um, look at these more to systematically understand um, how they're contributing and some of the ways in which uh, we could do interventions to scale them more. Um, I've just listed a few here. Um, the food industry, a lot of concern about food waste, so there's some interesting startups building platforms to address that issue. Electronics, huge amounts of electronics are thrown away these days and end up in landfills. Back market is an interesting platform in Europe uh, that's trying to address that issue. The steel industry has a scrap steel, um, so that's interesting to look at. Um, so platforms like Metal Hub, and then we heard a little bit about Idlefish today uh, in China, which is secondhand goods, uh, which is another area. Um, there's actually some M&A deals happening in this space, so I list them here. I won't go through all of them, but um, a fairly large one that happened in two th last year, in 2022, was Naver, which is the big Korean platform, bought Poshmark for $1.2 billion. So that's an interesting development, and it would be interesting to see more of these kinds of acquisitions so we can try to get the scale in, the, in this space. Um, there are now, um, I guess 10, 15 years ago, if you wanted to build a platform, you had to do it with your own resources and you had to do it internally. There's now a vibrant market for software vendors that build and supply uh, marketplaces. I list a couple of them here. Miracle is quite large. It's a multi-billion dollar company now and it's built more than 400 marketplaces around the world. Uh, Marketplacer, Spryker, ShareTribe, What's interesting is none of these platform service providers offer circular solutions yet. Um, and maybe it's because the demand doesn't exist for them to put it in their priorities of development for their product, um, but this is a gap. So if a company wanted to launch a marketplace, they would either have to take part of this and customize it or build their own. So there's a gap in the software uh, existing now. So as we all know, um, <clears throat> sellers play an integral role in marketplaces. They do a lot of things. <laughs> they um, help develop the product listings, the inventory, the order fulfillment, the customer service, the quality and pricing and promotion, right? And then that is blended with what the role of the platform provides, right? The platform um, actually sets the governance rules around what the suppliers can do on the platform and they onboard them, and that often takes uh, a long time and uh, can take months. Um, and platforms <clears throat> that are out there are trying to always reduce that uh, onboarding time. Um, there's verification screening, there's uh, a bunch of policy issues, and then there's the enforcement to make sure that those sellers are providing um, you know, their services on the terms and conditions that the platform set forth. Then there's seller performance, and then there's often data exchange, right? You share data with the sellers to help them understand how they're performing, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what's interesting, and this is all designed and optimized for the linear economy, not for the circular economy. So there's some very small indications that this is changing. Two examples, Zalando, which is a large platform in Germany, actually has started to set forth a set of policy conditions for sellers that are circular in orientation. I wouldn't say they're completely circular, but at least they're beginning to think about what that means. And I think this is an interesting case because it's pretty clear that what Zalando is thinking is, is that they want to capture the customers that are more willing to buy green and get the brand recognition and the brand equity associated with that. So they're consciously cultivating a green seller set of policy conditions that I think that they believe will position them well in the future to attract those customers that are willing to buy green and putting the 
policies and procedures in place to be able to do that. Um, eBay is doing this as well. It's quite interesting. eBay is, is pretty circular, <laughs> but it gets no brand equity um, benefits for that, which is pretty interesting. Nobody mentions it in discussions of circularity, and I don't know what's maybe the ex executive team or the marketing team at eBay is asleep at the switch, but um, they actually are doing quite a bit. They have a program called eBay Refurbish, and it sets forth the seller conditions to join that, and it's pretty restrictive. Not anybody can join that um, or meet those requirements. And eBay has come in with backstop guarantees. So if you're a buyer and you're dissatisfied with that, eBay will uh, make you whole. And so these are some of the conditions that I think are interesting and important to consider in terms of how do you take linear platforms and make them more circular. And if you go through, and I'm beginning in this process of doing the research, to actually look at the seller conditions across a range of platforms so that we can better understand, do they have policies in place? What are those policies? How strict are they? How do they enforce them? And so this would be a way to get a better sense of um, you know, how circular are they? How are they going about uh, enforcing those programs? And getting the word out that if you want to become and become known as a circular platform, here's how you go about uh, doing it. There's also some interesting conditions that are different from linear platforms in terms of payment processes and how you release payment and all this kind of stuff. So uh, when you list a good for sale, uh, and the buyer buys it, uh, they don't know if that's going to be of good quality or not. And so you don't want to release payment immediately until they sign off on it. And currently, there are very, very few payment providers that allow for this escrow kind of conditions to exist. So that's another, I would say, friction point or choke point or weakness in being able to launch uh, more circular platforms is the back-end payment systems need to be updated and made available. So just like on the vendor side, those vendors aren't offering this uh, circular component. The payment providers need to do that as well if these circular platforms are going to take off and become bigger. So what I'm going to do to close out here is to um, talk about a couple of areas, and I'm going to focus on Europe, where there is not a platform today but could be. And here's an interesting example. Uh, BMW has a corporate commitment to use more plastics in its new vehicles. And so it has um, made an arrangement with a small little Danish company that goes out and collects used plastic fishing nets. And they have pelletized those fishing nets and then they ship them, probably not directly to BMW, probably to one of their suppliers. And then they use that input material um, both for the trim for the vehicle you can see here and for their mats and things of that nature. So this is you know, what you would call kind of a transaction that's been arranged through the general economy through kind of a corporate commitment on the part of one OEM to use more recycled plastics. But imagine if all the European uh, OEMs got together and made a commitment that we're going to use 30% more recycled plastics, can you imagine the demand pull that would create? And suddenly you would have a whole bunch of little suppliers coming in, and of course the platform would set the conditions and say, you know, yes, we understand they're recycled plastics, but we need them to be of this specification, and yada, yada, yada. They could set those terms and conditions. So there could be, I think, and in a very interesting and powerful platform, not only in Europe, but in North America and Asia, in which big industries like the automobile industry um, gets together. And then the big question is, and I think this is a question for platform scholars, is who becomes the sponsor of that platform? Is it a startup? Well, if it's a startup, it's going to take it forever to reach scale. Or is it an OEM, like a VW, which is huge and has a large percentage of the market, but would other participants feel comfortable? Or does it have to be a state sponsor? I mean, there's a bunch of interesting organizational or institutional questions that uh, arise from this. But um, the potential is huge if a big industry decided to go this way. So that's one example. 
Um, the fashion industry is another one. Um, there's just an incredible amount of waste. Um, huge amounts of material gets just dumped into landfills uh, every year. And it's even worse um, because even good products, you know, returns have become a really big issue. The uh, digitalization and plat the rise of platforms have made it very easy for customers to send material back if they don't like it. Um, I think the costs in the US now are about $860 billion worth of returns every year. It's very difficult, or at least the companies say that it's very hard for them to repackage that and resell it. So a lot of that material ends up in landfills. It's huge waste. So there's tremendous opportunity, and I think interesting pressure, not only from you know, the industry, but the amount of bad publicity and attention in this sector, uh, again, to create a platform that could address some of the resale issues that are associated with the apparel uh, industry. Another is EV batteries. I think many people are super excited about the opportunities and the amount of penetration we've seen with electric vehicles. Um, and we're not seeing the end of life yet because this is a pretty new industry. But I tell you, by 2030 and 2035, there are going to be millions, millions of you know, end of life batteries. And these things cost between 10 and 15 million dollars, I'm sorry, 10 and 15 thousand dollars a piece and they have a lot of precious materials, lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese. Um, what's interesting is, is that the used car, I mean the car batteries are um, pretty durable. I mean they're, they're designed to be able to withstand the mobility. Um, and so even when they reach the end of life for a vehicle, it doesn't mean that they um, have reached their full end of life. So there's a potential for a secondary market for end of life uh, used car batteries in the electric power industry, which is pretty interesting for backup power for intermittent renewables and things. But the automobile industry and the power industry, they don't know anything about each other. <laughs> so there's a huge opportunity for a matching platform to match uh, used car batteries of a certain specification. And there's a ton of activity happening right now around digital tracing and digital twins and collecting the data to know how many times a battery has been used, um, charged and discharged. So that information could be used to determine where it ends up, uh, either in the electric power industry or into scrap to be uh, reused. So there does not exist today in Europe or in North America. Um, a platform for EV batteries, huge opportunity uh, there as well. Another one is used oil. We don't usually typically think about lubricants, um, but um, huge amounts of lubricants are used to power our economies, um, and it can be recycled. Um, unfortunately, a lot of this ends up back into the environment, quite damaging. Uh, in Asia, I think 60% ends up being burned, either in marine or in stationary low-end boilers. Um, so huge opportunity to create a marketplace for lubricants um, all around the world. And then finally, solar panels. Again, we're all excited about the <laughs> you know, market penetration of solar, costs coming down, but the forecasts for the amount of material that's going to end up in landfills if nothing is done is staggering. 60 million tons by 2035. Um, and so this is another area calling out for a marketplace that could potentially collect these and then have them sent off to recycling plants and then matched with the end users. So lots of interesting opportunities uh, for marketplaces. I think um, there's a ton of interesting research that needs to be done in this area, and I just point out uh, this issue of what kind of model could be uh, established to help facilitate this. In some cases, a private market, a private actor company would come in and it would be completely uh, commercial and there would be sufficient revenue to sustain that platform and grow it. Um, and in some cases, you're going to need some sort of pub public-private partnership. And in some in cases, you may need a completely pri you know, com uh, public company or public government to come in and subsidize it and maybe uh, subcontract to a commercial entity to actually run it. Um, we need to do systematic analysis to look across these different dimensions. I gave you five examples about where 
um, pure private seems to work or where we may need public-private partnerships or a public company to come in. And it may depend on, you know, the institutional issues in a particular country. There's a bunch of uh, factors that would play into it. So I think uh, the opportunity for circular platforms are huge and much needed. And uh, this is, a, you know, a great group to get thinking about this and uh, test these ideas and really put these forward in front of uh, policymakers because right now they, they're just not aware of it. So with that, uh, finished up and thank you very much.